Hey, nice to meet you. Nice Should to meet you. Should I roll the windows up or is it okay, you think? Uh, I'm just worried about like the bus thing. Right. Yeah, let's roll it up. Or let's try. Um, and then if it gets insufferable, we'll uh, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll roll down the windows again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I wonder if this is probably too noisy. The a fan or something? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty low actually. Is there is there is there a fan on? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's really quiet for a car. You know, but we're we seem to be like in the middle of the most industrial area. Yeah, which is odd. Uh, <laughs> didn't really think about all that. Anyway, yeah. it doesn't okay. matter. But we can all hop right. into this. We'll uh, the name of the film is called Rodents of Unusual Size, <laughs> which is uh, directed by three three of you guys, right? Yeah, it's you, yeah. Jeff Springer, Quinn Costello, Quinn Costello, and finally. Chris Metzler. Chris Metzler, yeah. all of which I, I guess was my original introduction. I think he may have introduced me to the documentary. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, he does a lot of promotion stuff for he's the film. He's good with that? Yeah, so that's his specialty. I so think. why isn't he here in the film? Because <laughs> uh, he's not uh, in New York, I guess. He's not here in the film. No, he, he does a lot of, uh, yeah, the organizing and um, and promotion of the film. And, oh, good. And so, and then, like, <laughs> I you know shot the film and, and Quinn edited, so we all have oh. kind of different things. But you just sort of identify yourself as co-directors? Yeah, yeah. Even so though you have... You... Final decisions, like, yeah, we'd all, like, between the three of us, basically. Oh, okay. So, and it's good, but do you have three people... Because then, um, you know, you can always outvote. <laughs> it's not like two people. Oh, so. that's true. Where you yeah. hit, hit, like, yeah, that you got to always have uh, two against one or. Yeah. 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 That so that actually, we're, people always ask, like, is it is it too many people? But it actually works out. OK. Anyway, let's let's just set it up a little. Uh, the, again, it's called Rodents of Unusual Size. Did I catch up with it at Maryland? Is that possible for you? Did you um, screen in Maryland? Where I did you sc- think? Did we? I can't. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I was at a festival. I thought I saw it there. But regardless, these are swamp rats, right? A.K.A. Nutria? Yeah. What they're weird. 20 yeah. pound rodents from Argentina, basically, that yeah. were brought um, mm-hmm. here to make, to do fur farms in the 30s and 40s. And oh, then okay. as a result they um, of being there, they then they got loose eventually and they uh, got into the bayou and then they started eating right. everything up. So They got up to uh, Louisiana. Yeah. Right? And uh, because we should mention that uh, Wendell Pierce is your narrator. Did he also have any other title in the no i he's mean just a, yeah a he's a narrator but um it was really great to work with him because we had written a script but when he came in <laughs> to record he was able to um really give it some louisiana flavor let's yeah, say he's from, it's he's not from there. just a straight voiceover but you know a bit of an accent but also he's like let's put a y'all here or you know yeah um, give and, it a little bit more cajun flavor yeah and and you know he's from new orleans and he, he is, grew up yeah. around um around nutria so he knows <laughs> a lot about nutria so he was kind of like the perfect voice for us yeah and bonus did my podcast oh well that's See? yeah so not too long ago either. I just met him. He was uh, cool. he was kind of the lead. He had it was almost a, he had almost a romantic lead in this. I think that was one of the main reasons he took it because it was kind of a different part than the normal cop that he plays. Yeah, <laughs> very yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's you know. good. Yeah. Anyhow, so there is a uh, bit of an infestation. The yeah. problem is twofold, right? There's too many of these rodents and and they're huge but they're 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 not vicious right they're not uh, no no not really not. if they get cornered they they might bite you but yeah, they it, it was and it, who wouldn't um yeah exactly and and but even when i was like would corner them at the zoo exhibit where it was able to get into the zoo exhibit with them they they would just flee and it yeah. actually was a big challenge in, in doing the film some people do keep them as pets right yeah so they have uh, the ability for to be affectionate yeah, and the, and um, so there's a pet that's in the film, but the, it, it's called Little Bit, and she won't get close to anyone except for her basically own. her owner and and Fear. his his the girlfriend and girlfriend's son. But actually, to make the film to get close-ups of Nutria, we had a train Nutria, and so she it, her name's Nudie the Nutria, and mm-hmm. has a Facebook page and everything, and she's an animal performer that we were able to use to get some more close-up shots of Nutrias, and oh. she's actually you can hold her in your hands and and pet her and everything. So so, but she's a very different nutria than typically what you encounter. 
So there is... I mean, it's a lot better than it used to be because okay. of the bounty program that's in the film. Okay. And so they so, get paid $5 a tail to bring them in. So that's I keep, kept them yeah. under control. So so people come and they... they, they they make they buckshot essentially these the the they come in and this is a way for because it's in a poor community, I mean it's a re- the island of Delacroix where where the film mostly takes place right yeah it's a uh, it's relative I mean there's a poor population there I mean I don't know, maybe there's a rich population but there are a lot of people are are making extra money making ends meet by going and uh, shooting the uh, the uh, the nutria right yeah I mean and a lot of it is they have things for employment uh, on other times of the year like crabs or alligators and things uh-huh. and then oh, come the winter season. time there's really nothing going on oh right so it, and nutria season kind of fills that in in a way yeah. and gives them a, you know a source of income for that winter those winter months and you said there's how much a tail five dollars a five dollars a tail so literally they kill them they cut off the tail and they bring the tails in as proof that they've um, killed the the the, uh, the the nutria yeah the yeah brand. and they usually put it, people put it in their freezer because they don't go right into the tail collection site and um, so people come in with these big blocks of tails that are frozen together and um, we actually would hang out at these tail collection sites and it was like the best place to meet nutria hunters sure because you can just hang out in the parking lot and they they tow this trailer around and they they um, you know there are certain places on certain days and people come in and turn in their tails mm-hmm. um. And so the the other issue that I met, I was mentioning there were two was that that the swamp land itself was eroding. Uh, this was a natural habitat and a natural uh, you know preserved area, very unique, right? Very um, indigenous to the area, the environment, and very important for the environment. And it was being eroded by the infestation of these. Swamp rats. So, the eco balance needed to be created, and which it seems like I guess they are. They have successfully. Yeah, I mean it's, it's not completely successful, but they they are keeping them under control. Like there was twenty five million at one point, and now we're like at a few million. And so that that's for them enormous. that's a huge success. Yeah. You know they eat these the roots of the plants that hold the land together. So the more that they eat, the right. more the land just falls apart. Yeah, so. it's 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 so because it's kind of floating. Yeah, there's and and it's like without plants to hold the land together, it just it just falls into the Gulf, you know. Right. Oh so my gosh. Um, yeah, they and they breed like crazy. They have babies all the time, and and so a couple litters a year, and and so they just it, yeah. You, and if you have just one, you might get rid of all of them, but if you just have one, then there's gonna be <laughs> ten <laughs> gonna, yeah. next week. Yeah. Do they have to eradicate the whole race in order to really get? I mean, as far as the safety and preservation of the swamplands. Don't they just need to kind of eradicate? Or they're not meant to be there. They're meant to be in Argentina. Yeah, they're they're not meant to be there. But they also um, what do they, do they help the land at all? No, they don't help the land at all. I mean, they they were a, a source of fur for a while, and that was an economic yeah. stimulus. But that was but and then the eighties came, and and fur fell out, out of fashion, and then they got out of control. But um, but yeah, there's really no hope of ever getting rid of them. Um, the nutrient control program is basically. Um, they they see that it's never going to be you know can totally eradicate them, but Could, with all the nooks and crannies in Louisiana, have local scientists or environmentalists figured out the threshold for at least keeping the swamp lands safe? Like in other words, they can figure out how many they have to keep the population of the swamp rats or nutrient down to a certain so, uh, population in order for the swamp lands to be able to recover, you know, and exist. I mean. Yeah, there's um there's a lot of um it they they lose like about a football field an hour in Louisiana of land loss. And there's um and once that land is gone it's really difficult to bring it back, but there is the human intervention and in and that they'll they'll create areas with um like plastic barriers and they build land back and they plant plants there. Oh, to, to they are doing it. that. But with the nutrient if there's too many nutrient around, they'll just eat it up. So they kind of they 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 they're trying to keep the nutrient as low as they can, mm-hmm. but um but if they didn't, then there would be no hope of of rebuilding some of this land. And how many people are we talking about that are out there um, during the season hunting? Do we um, know? I don't do know sense? offhand. No, I can't. Uh, I mean, are you talking about like thousands of people, or are you talking about just a few hundred or something? It's you probably a a f- like a few hundred. Yeah, I'm hanging and, out at the uh, like at that station that you described. Maybe. And they need to be. Um, they have like a license from the state, so they're actually registered with the Nutria Control Program. So it's not just anyone can go out and get Nutria. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's fairly easy to get that, but um, it's it's people that are. 
um, in the registry. And then when they do turn in tails, they give information on, you know, how many and, and mm-hmm. where they found them and what, you know, what the, what the land that, that they found them on. So they can do a lot of, um, you know, it's for research. People that hunt these, their only incentive is to turn in the tail, they get a five dollars. They're gonna have extra money for bringing in the actual animal. So, what are they doing with the carcasses? Most of the people just throw it in the swamp, and so that's a huge that, waste. And yeah, but that's okay for the environment. It's right? it's 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 probably not is great, it? but it's also like haven't heard of it being too much of a of a problem. Um, and but this is why there's a lot of people that want to do something with the the carcasses, and and it, so in the film we have a, a collective of designers that. Um, it wants to use the fur, and their idea is if they can bring back fur, um, that that will help, you know, eradicate the rodents. So it's like by, you know, cr- um, creating clothes and things with, with new yeah. fur. Um, and then other people want to eat them as well. So that's, um, you know, if they can use them for something. And, it, and there's a, a, a dog food company that also uses Nutria. So people are trying to create this demand and um, and actually don't let the Nutrias go to waste. It doesn't, you know, I mean, the whole idea of fur was that the animals were being killed for the manufacturing of fur coats and other fur-lined items. And that... Um, that was, uh, you know, for the animal activists, animal rights activists, that that was a, uh, a kind of a criminal thing. And now what we're having is kind of a, a, an eco issue. There's environmental justification for making fur uh, clothes and other fur items, it seems to me. Yeah. But ju- there's a great justification for it. Uh, so I wonder how the animal activists respond to that. You know, I'm wondering, I don't know if you've had any conversations or maybe during screenings or after screenings, if you've ever run into any of those folks and what their feelings are about that. Because I see this as a great opportunity. This is a great, uh, if their fur is great and it can uh, help whatever economy and also at the same time help the, you know, ecosystem down there in Delacroix and in Louisiana, that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, we actually were expecting a lot more pushback from um and we tried to strike a good balance of of um Mm -hmm. respecting the animal rights activists and and you know i i I get what their concerns but um people like PETA and stuff have um they don't say much about this nutrient control problem i mean they don't it doesn't do them any good that's why yeah i mean i'm I'm a pro animal activist yeah activism don't get me wrong but i also know that there's a you know uh, there's a always a marginal group or you know what i'm saying there's always a fringe group that are just don't think things th- really through you know the same yeah. same with hunting like it's, there are justifications for to, for hunting and it, you know especially if you're going to reuse those the if you're going to use the animals for their fur for the meat you know because some of the also we should mention the hunters eat eat these animals right after they kill them they don't all get thrown back in the swamp yeah yeah there's some people that do eat them is that um, a desperation issue or do they actually really they they bring them to restaurants too it, or, or well to cooks? it's no? it's it's difficult to bring it to restaurants because of of fda health, health um issues. requirements so um but there are a few people that eat them but it's pretty rare honestly okay. like because i think in louisiana you have so many good things to eat you have crabs <laughs> and and alligator and all these other things, oh, so, so that a nutri is kind of a hard sell. I mean, pe- some people do eat them, yeah. but it's it's pretty minimal. Right. Yeah. It doesn't. I'm not uh, even thinking that that's going to be a, a, a particularly uh, delicious meal. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> no, it's pretty good. I've had it a few times. Oh, you did. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's, it's not bad. Eat snakes too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So not... yeah. I mean, I've always always surprised because people down there would be so disgusted about um, the nutri because it has a, a like a rat like tail. And yet right. they would eat a. Like and they're a called raccoon. swamp rats, but that's just a, <laughs> that's just a nickname. They're not. Yeah. They're not. Are they not really? They're not actually a rat. So that's no. kind of more like a slang. They're a rodent. So they're not vermin, even though they're rodents. Yeah. Like they we are... think of rats as vermin, regardless of where they are. Yeah, and, and you know a beaver's a rodent too. So it's a it's a big family of animals. So, okay. Is um, it is a vermin? Do you know uh, the specifically like the definition? Maybe vermin are disease carriers, and that's I'm why they're called. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's something to look into. Yeah. If you're out there what and you're listening, vermin? write in. <laughs> Jeff Springer at <laughs> AOL.com. Uh, the name again of the movie is called Rodents of Unusual Size, directed by Jeff Springer, Chris Metzler, and Quinn Costello. Yeah. See how good I am. And and tell me, uh, it premiered where? 
It premiered at Doc NYC last oh, year. Okay, and that, then um, that maybe that's where I saw it. And then we've been um, doing um, festivals and uh, since a lot of festivals. And so, and then we'll be um, on on Independent Lens uh, yeah. next next year. That's early awesome. next year. Yeah, I think you're you're right. Yeah, it's funny because. Um, I had Lois Vossen, who is the executive director of, of Independent Lens. I met with her yesterday, coincidentally. And I know you. we had been emailing back and forth about timing of this thing, and uh, we just figured out we were probably going to try to meet yesterday, but it ended up meeting today. And in the midst of that, I met with Lois, and uh, the subject of rats came up, <laughs> as they yeah, will often. it always usually comes up. In New York City, because <laughs> I think, you know, we were talking about bed bugs, <laughs> and then that led us to talk about rats, and then she goes, it's funny you mention we're talking about rats, because one of our films in our, blah, 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 and it turned out to be yours. I said, yes, that's funny, because I'm about to podcast with these guys. And uh, she said, I'm, I may run into them today, which, which <laughs> she did. So yeah. a nice convergence going yeah, on there. Yeah. So, yeah, the next few days will be through Connecticut, and then the next week in Brooklyn at the Alamo Draft House, oh, and okay. then uh, Long Island, and then we'll be playing at the Stranger Than Fiction with Tom Powers and, and the IFC Center. That's a nice, and yeah. And week and the week after that. So That's great. And then you'll be on ind- Independent Lens, as you mentioned. And, and, and uh, is it going to be the- out theatrically? Uh, in any other cities? Um, we are in the middle of that. We're in Chicago okay. right now. Okay. And then um, we just, we're just finishing up Portland and Seattle. We premiered oh. there this last Friday. So mm-hmm. I was just got back from Seattle. And so they, those are both week-long runs. So they're currently running there. And then um, we finished up runs in San Francisco and L.A. Um, and New Orleans. So those are already complete. But... Um, but yeah, up coming up is still Chicago and Seattle, and and then around the the, the New York area. Mm-hmm. Um, that's wonderful. It's an it's it's a fascinating movie. It's also entertaining, and you know, it's it's yeah, it's, a, it's just a fascinating story. You guys really managed to tell, you know, oh, of thanks. something you may not necessarily think would be, or maybe people would be squeamish. But these animals, other than their teeth, <laughs> and those rat tails. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've always been. Uh, a lot of people have come to us like, "Oh, we don't want to watch that movie because it's about giant rats." And then yeah. people see the movie, and then they're oh. generally, and they're, you know, it's a, really about the people. A lot yeah, of it. So. Right. That's right. There is a number of people that you follow that are are out there hunting for the rats, and you kind of follow their story a little bit, at least as far as the 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 hunt and the post hunt goes. Yeah. You know what yeah. they do with the animal, uh, or you know what the relationship with the animal is. Um, so. Yeah, people should realize that, like you said, did you say beavers were rodents? Yeah. Nobody's ever squeamish around beavers. Everybody yeah. loves a beaver, so, <laughs> as I always say. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, this thanks for having me. This Anytime. Uh, again, we'll, we'll keep everybody apprised of the trajectory of the film, which right now includes the theatrical, which is going on, and then in the early winter, uh, or early in the new year, I should say, in 2019, it will be having a broadcast premiere, which is huge for any documentary. Right? How many documentaries every year get a broadcast? Yeah, and also just That's a on question. a show a- like answer the question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding> <laughs> but not very many. <laughs> not very but, many. But yeah, it's also great to be on a show like Independent Lens because I know this season is, is going to be great. With yeah. there's a lot of oh, good it stuff looks coming like an up. Amazing season, and also just think of the sheer number of people who will be able to see the film. And it streams on their site for two weeks or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, they stream when it for they two premiere weeks it. After, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Good luck with everything with that. Say hi to Chris and Quinn and, uh, you know, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Will do. Yeah, thanks very much.